have spent the last several meetings talking about between group comparisons starting with two very simple situations in which you was, we were simply comparing the performance of one group with one other group either through Z testing or through T testing and then a, an extension of that logic where we still had a single independent variable a single dependent variable but there were more than two levels of the independent variable that is there were more than two groups and we uh, we looked at we examined uh, ways of analyzing data of that kind through analysis of variance that is through an F test implicit in each of those situations is the logic of causality that is the assumption that changes in the independent variable the amount of exposure to violent TV that children receive or um, the effects of a weight loss program or the effects of a scholastic aptitude preparation program will have some effect on some outcome, some dependent variable. So as I've said, we were always testing a very simple model, simple causal model that changes in O, an independent variable, cause changes in O, some dependent variable. The only, as I've indicated, the only uh, innovation in all of this was, or the only consideration in all of this, was whether the independent variable had two levels or more than two levels. When it had two levels, we used a z-test or a t-test and when it, the independent variable had more than two levels, we used an f-test or analysis of variance, which is potentially a two-step process. That is, this overall analysis of variance, the overall f-test, which tests the null hypothesis that all group are equal, that is there are no statistically significant differences. To the extent that you reject that overall null hypothesis, we then saw that you have to invoke a multiple comparison test which will lead you back to the simplest situation, a situation in which you're comparing the performance of one group with the performance of one other group. the discussion that we're going to start today has a different logic to it um, and the most obvious difference is that we are no longer talking about causality and we no longer have some sort of intrusion or experimental condition um, ultimately we'll be talking, we'll, we'll, we'll look at regression analysis, we'll look first at correlation which is the basis of regression analysis, we'll then look at regression analysis which is a sort of analysis that uh, economists for example use when predicting the rate of economic growth or the rate of unemployment and that word it will become routine, that is prediction or a predictive variable or a set of predictive variables uh, being used either alone or in some combination to predict some outcome variable. Uh, and as I've indicated, one example of this uh, that, sh that I suspect is familiar to all of you is the sorts of analysis that lead to predictions of unemployment rate or predictions of growth in the housing market or predictions of growth or change in the economy. And when predicting change in the economy, the, amongst the predictive variables might be, for example, the rate of unemployment or the rate of growth in, or, or, or the rate of change in the housing market and so on. But the basis of this sort of analysis is uh, correlation and we've talked about correlation previously 
in the context of measurement reliability. In the context of measurement reliability, we were interested in the relationship or the association or the correlation between two sets of scores. A set of scores achieved at time one and a set of scores achieved at time two. And we used to determine the correlation between those two sets of scores Pearson product moment R. I said at the time when, when defining Pearson product moment R that R was a general measure of linear bivariate correlation. And that is the case. It's a general measure of linear bivariate correlation. That is there are a number of situations in which Pearson product moment R can be useful as, as a statistical tool. But those situations must have two characteristics. First of all, the researcher must be interested in the linear relationship <coughs> between the variables and not the non-linear relationship. And when I talked about Pearson product moment R, in the context of test-retest reliability, I think I also, I recall pointing out or offering examples of some recurrent non-linear relationships. For example, your anxiety or my level of anxiety and the proximity of a uh, hurricane in the Gulf. That relationship is, is non-linear. That is, it appears not to be the case that our level of anxiety and uh, distance from the coast, uh, it appears that, our rela that that relationship is not linear. That is, our anxiety does not go up in a linear way as the storm gets closer. What appears to happen is that our level of anxiety remains low and pretty stable until the storm is essentially on top of us and then it escalates dramatically and then levels off. A an example of a non-linear relationship that also explains why when I get to the grocery store there is no bottled water and no batteries left because apparently I don't reach this level of anxiety until a little, just a day or two after most people all those with common sense Pearson product moment are then the second attribute of the, the circumstances where Pearson product moment R is useful is that the researcher is concerned about the relationship between two variables as I indicated previously, if the researcher is interested in the relationship between more than two variables, Pearson product moment R is not useful at all. If you're interested in uh, on the GRE, it used to be the case that three things were measured. Verbal ability, quantitative ability, and reasoning ability. If you simply wanted to know the correlation between verbal ability and quantitative ability, Pearson product moment R would be an appropriate tool to use. If you, if you were simply interested in the relationship between verbal ability and reasoning ability, Pearson product moment R would be a, 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 an appropriate tool to use. But if you want to know the relationship between these three variables, you need some other tool. Because Pearson product moment R 
is appropriate when you're interested, as I've indicated, in the linear relationship, but more specifically the linear relationship between two variables. We had observed when we talked previously that Pearson product moment R must assume a value greater than or equal to minus one and less than or equal to plus one. And we also observed that Pearson product moment R informs the researcher about two attributes of the relationship. First is the direction of the relationship. That is, positive values of R indicate that the two variables, let's call those two variables X and Y, are related positively to one another. That is, this sort of relationship. As values of X increase, values of Y increase. So that low values of X are associated with relatively low values of Y and high values of X are associated with relatively high values of Y. This is a, an example of a positive relationship. Contrarily, negative values of R indicate a negative relationship between X and Y. That is a relationship of this kind. A relationship in which low values of X are associated with high values of Y. High values of X are associated with low values of Y. So Pearson product moment R informs the researcher first about the direction of the relationship. We observed as well that Pearson product moment R informs the researcher about the strength of the relationship. And we observed that as R departs from zero, as it approaches absolute value of one, that indicates an increasingly strong relationship. If R equals zero, then X and Y are independent of one another. There is no relationship. If R equals, if, the, if R equals either plus one or minus one, it indicates that X and Y are redundant. That is, they s essentially sit on top of one another. This second example indicates simply that this is X and it's Y. So there is no separation between X and Y. To the extent that R is assumed some value between zero and absolute one, then there is some degree of overlap between X and Y. Some amount of shared space or shared variance. Yeah. Can you repeat that again? Can I repeat what again? This is the circumstance when R assumes a value that is not equal to zero and not equal to plus one or minus one. The issue, of course, is that as the absolute value of R increases, so the amount of overlap, the amount of redundancy between X and Y increases. 
And that indicates that the relationship between X and Y becomes stronger and stronger. That is, for example, if R equals minus 0.4 and R equals plus 0.4, these two relationships are of equal strength. It's simply the case that one is a negative relationship and the other is a positive relationship. But in terms of relational strength, the two are equivalent. If R equals minus 0.7, that relationship is stronger than either of the other two. That is, when dealing with or when interpreting relational strength, the direction of the relationship is irrelevant. Are there any questions about Pearson product moment R in general or interpreting values of R? Yes. So uh, that point uh, negative negative point seven R, that does not have the equal strength as the negative point four, does it? No. No. Um, let's assume this is a relationship measure of the relationship between I and B. This is a measure of the relationship between C and D, and this is the relationship between E and F. The relationship between E and F is stronger than either of the other two relationships. Because the absolute value of R, 0.7, is greater in that instance than in either of the other cases. The relationship between I and B and that between C and D are of equal strength. The only difference is that one of these relationships, that between I and B, is negative, and the other, that between C and D, is positive. Are there any other questions? We had, in the context of test retest reliability, we invoked a arbitrary but commonly used uh, rule to apply to the issue of relational strength. That is to determine when a relationship was of sufficient strength to conclude that an instrument was reliable and when it was not of a sufficient strength. To, to make that conclusion. And that arbitrarily but conventional rule was 0.7, plus 0.7. The issue of relational strength or relational significance is more commonly decided through P. Actually, the familiar comparison between P and alpha And in the journals will be reported in this way. R x y equals plus point two three. Actually, let me go back a step. R x y parentheses let's say forty six equals plus 0.23 P less than 0.02. It's this sort of statement that in the current context you need to be able to interpret. And interpreting this statement is straightforward. 
This obviously simply means the correlation between the observed X and Y scores with 46 pairs of scores equals plus 0.23. The probability of this relationship, a relationship of this strength occurring by chance is less than 0.02. What was the point or plus point two three? The linear correlation, the observed linear correlation between the observed X and Y scores, and there are forty six pairs of those scores, equals plus point two three. And the probability of a relationship of this strength occurring by chance is less than point oh two. The null hypothesis in this instance is that R x y equals zero. This is the null hypothesis. Let me make an observation uh, before we go any further. If the observed correlation was minus 0.23, the probability of that, a relationship of that magnitude occurring by chance would still be less than 0.02. <coughs> that is, the direction of the relationship is irrelevant. It's w because we're again talking about the strength or significance of the relationship. Yeah. So it's not it's not the case that positive relationships are more likely to be statistically significant than negative relationships. The direction of the relationship is incidental. If we have two researchers, researcher A and researcher B. If A sets alpha equal to 0.05 and researcher B sets alpha to 0.01, which of these researchers will reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a statistically significant relationship, statistically significant correlation between X and Y. <laughs> no, both will not. Um, the conven I, let, let me clarify because because I, I sort of understand why why you might argue both. Because you don't know the precise value of P. Yeah, let, let me talk about this convention. On a, on a uh, data analytic output, that is, if you invoke a, a statistical package such as SPSS or SAS, and input values, pairs of scores achieved from the same individuals. For example, you're correlating their level, their score on an extraversion test with their score on a test of disclosure. The output would include a p-value, and that p-value would be given to you as something like 0.017. But the p-value isn't really 0.017 because it's simply been rounded off. That is, there are values out here. It's 0.017 something. So that in order to... Re it, it's not accurate to report this in a way that you say p in this, in, in, in this area here 0.017 
P equals 0.017. What researchers typically do is to indicate to two decimal places because they're interested in comparing it with alpha, which is established to two decimal places. So we would, in this instance, we would indicate that P was less than 0.02. Yeah. It's simply this convention. That being the case, what we know about the probability value here is that it's some, somewhere between 0.01 and 0.02. It's greater than 0.01 and less than 0.02. This doesn't, it seems to me that this doesn't matter to researcher I. Researcher I is going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a statistically significant linear relationship between X and Y. And why is the re researcher I going to reject the null hypothesis? Because the likelihood of committing a type 1 error, which is less than 0.02, is less than that researcher's willingness to commit a type 1 error, which is 0.05. This was the logic. It was the logic in Z-testing and T-testing, although in those two contexts we made the decision by comparing a critical value of a test statistic, which is the analog to the alpha value, with an obtained value of that test statistic which is the analogue to the, to the p-value. But in ANOVA, we went through this process, this comparison, just as it is presented here. That is, at the end of the ANOVA output, there was some p-value. And evaluation of the null hypothesis was a function of comparing that p-value, the probability of committing a type 1 error, with alpha, the researcher's willingness to commit a type 1 error. And what we decided was, we didn't decide it, we didn't just decide it, what we learned was that if p is less than alpha, you reject the null hypothesis. If the probability of committing a type 1 error is less than the researcher's willingness or your willingness to commit a type 1 error, you reject the null hypothesis. The likelihood of committing a type 1 error in this case is less than 0.02. That is less than researcher A's willingness to commit a type 1 error, which is 0.05. The research, researcher A is willing to take a 5 in 100 chance of committing a type 1 error and is being asked to take less than a 2 in 100 chance of committing a type 1 error. Researcher A, therefore, rejects the null hypothesis. Is there anybody who has any uncertainty about this? And I've said before, if you have uncertainty, if you're not clear, you should indicate that. It's not an indication of being stupid or slow or anything else. It may simply be a function of me having my head in Austin waiting for my daughter to have this baby uh, and the fact that perhaps my lectures are unclear. So you can make an external attribution to me and I'll make an external attribution to my daughter. So it's really all my daughter's fault, is what I'm trying to say. Everybody clear on Researcher A's decision? If everybody's clear on Researcher A's decision, what does Researcher B do? Would everybody agree 
that researcher B fails to reject the null hypothesis. Because researcher A is willing to take only a 1 in 100 chance of committing a type 1 error and is being asked to take something more than that, a chance greater than that. and therefore fails to reject the null hypothesis and concludes that there is no statistically significant relationship between X and Y. We ou no. Yes or no. The issues are essentially the same as when we encountered Pearson product moment R previously. Except that the, the field is now broader. That is, the attributes of Pearson product moment R do not change. It must still assume a value between greater than or equal to minus one and less than or equal to plus one. Negative values of R continue to indicate a negative or inverse relationship. Positive values of R continue to indicate a positive or direct relationship between the two variables. The two things that have altered have to do with relational strength. That is, and, and really only one thing has altered, and that is the standard that we invoke to decide whether the relationship is significant or non-significant. In the context of test-retest reliability, we invoke this standard that R had to be equal to or greater than plus 0.7. In a, more, in a broader context, the decision is a function of the comparison between P and alpha, between the observed likelihood of committing a type 1 error and the researcher's willingness to commit a type 1 error. One further observation. This is really a reflection of degrees of freedom again. The number of pairs of scores you have is simply a reflection of degrees of freedom, as has always been the case. Because the total degrees of freedom, whether we were conducting a z-test, a t-test, or an analysis of variance, was always based on n. As n increases, as the degrees of freedom increase, so smaller and smaller correlations can be, can become, will become statistically significant, all other things being equal. For example, if rather than degrees of freedom equal to 46 or pairs equal to 46, we had 152 pairs. This p-value would be less than, than the current level. It might be less than 0 0.001. This is always the case. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about correlation and Pearson product moment R or whether we're talking about z-testing and t-testing or analysis of variance. The more people you have in a study, the more likely it is that you will find statistically significant differences. The fewer people you have in a study, the less likely it is that you will find statistically significant differences. In the context of correlation, a relatively low correlation 
for example, 0.11. If you have 40 people in the study, that correlation is likely to be non-significant. If you have 2,000 people in the study, the correlation will be highly significant. I, I mention this for two reasons. One, so you know it, and two, so you can apply it, and apply it not simply in this classroom. You will come across research that has used a lot of participants, that is a lot of subjects, where N is very hard. It is likely that that research will be littered with statistically significant differences or statistically significant correlations. You should be aware that that may simply be a function of the number of people involved in the study and that the differences or the relationships may be quite trivial. In practical terms, they may be quite trivial. I think if we were to as an example, determine that the correlation between X, the observed correlation between X and Y was equal to 0.07, we would conclude without any further information that that was a trivial relationship. The two variables are essentially independent because 0.07 is essentially zero. If you have 50 people in the study, you're likely to make that conclusion because the p-value will be, will be quite high. If you have hundreds of people in the study, you're likely to, the researcher is likely to make the quite opposite conclusion because with hundreds of people in the study, the, P, the associated p-value is likely to be quite low, 0 0.009. And when you compare this p-value with alpha, you're likely to reject the null hypothesis. You should be after today, more sensitive and more cognitively complex and more statistically complex than that. When researchers start jumping up and down about statistical significance and the correlation is very low, I think the sensible thing to do is to reject that relationship as non-significant. Non-significant in a practical sense. See, the same is true when comparing X bar 1 with X bar 2 with X bar N. If we were to discover that X bar 1 equals 4.0 and X bar 2 equals 4.2, when you simply look at those scores, you're likely to say the difference between them is trivial. That there's no statistically significant, or there's no practically important difference between the two scores. However, if N is of sufficient size, if, if, if this researcher has used a large sample the likelihood is that the researcher will reject the null hypothesis because the p-value will be quite low. And it's, it's simply a function of sample size. It's simply a function of having a lot of people in the sample so that when you come to interpret these sorts of analyses, you ought to be sensitive not simply to whether the difference is statistically significant or whether it is not statistically significant, 
particularly when the researcher decides that the relationship or the difference is statistically significant, you ought to look at sample size. And if the researcher has used a lot of folks in the research, and if the correlation or the difference between groups is of very low order, I think what we ought to do is simply reject dismiss that statistically significant difference as one that is of no practical consequence. A measure of overlap is given by R squared. So that if R equals plus or minus 0 0.7, 0 0.7 squared is 0 0.49. That is, 49% of all of the variance in X and Y is shared. If R equals 0.07, R squared is 0.0049. Yes? Which means that less than 1% of all of the variance is shared. The overlap between X and Y is minimal. Knowledge of X provides you essentially no knowledge of Y. The, the simple point of this that I keep coming back to is your focus should extend beyond whether the researcher decides that the observed correlation or the observed between group difference is statistically significant. You should look to at the magnitude of the correlation or at the magnitude of the between group difference in conjunction with sample size. This runs contrary to an observation we made earlier in the semester. One observation that we made earlier in the semester was that as sample size increases, the reliability and the validity of the statistics associated with that sample increases. And on that basis alone, because if you want reliable and valid statistics, such as group mean, you, it would, that rule would argue that large samples are, should be preferred over small samples. And that's true. But there's a caveat to that. And that is one cheap way of generating statistical significance is to use hundreds of thousands of, 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 of participants. One, similarly, one cheap way to avoid finding statistical significance is to use very few participants. So that if you're working for Exxon and you want to argue that your product is no more corrosive or no more dangerous to the environment than a product produced by Shell, one cheap way of making that conclusion, of biasing the research, is to simply use a small sample to collect data from a small number of areas. If you want to prove that your product is superior to, uh, you know, if your, your gasoline, top level gasoline uh, produces more miles per gallon than that produced by Shell, one cheap way of doing that, or one way of biasing the research toward that conclusion is to collect a lot of data, to have thousands upon thousands of data points. And re not all researchers are as honest as me. 
there are, not only are there clear biases in the commercial world toward <coughs> certain conclusions, that is, clearly Exxon and Shell and, and, and IBM and Dell and everybody else out there, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, that, that what they want to do is demonstrate either that their product is in some way better or that their product is at least no worse than. It has no worse effect on the environment than something else. And what I'm pointing out to you, trying to point out to you, is that you can bias the research toward the desired outcome simply by the number of observations that are included in the sample. There is an inherent and similar bias in academic research. No journal is going to publish null findings. That is, if, 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 if an academic researcher conducts her or his research and fails to reject the null hypotheses, nobody's going to print that. Nobody. So there is an inherent bias to reject the null hypothesis. And one way of doing that is to use a lot of people, or increase the likelihood that that will be the case, is to use a lot of people in the sample. And you ought to be alert to that when you go to the journals. It, it, simply because it's academic research does not mean that it's bias-free. And the bias can be introduced by manipulation of the sample size. Are there any questions? Well, presuming that my daughter does not deliver next Tuesday, and I will be in a mental institution if it takes that long, um, we will move from discussion of correlation to discussion of regression. Let me say, make one observation before we finish. Much of the chapter on correlation focuses on how you compute Pearson product moment R. You're not going to be required to compute values of Pearson product moment R. You're going to be required to make interpretations of the sorts of statements that, that link R to a, an observed value to a probability value. And you're going to be called upon to interpret R in the sense that it indicates a positive or negative relationship, uh, that sort of thing. But you will not be required to compute values of R, so don't bother reading it. Okay? Au revoir.